Okay, folks, uh, welcome uh, back to the Education Summit. Uh, I'm so excited to be here with you all today. My name is Matt Stull. Uh, I, I'll be the moderator for the session, uh, and uh, we've got some really great abstracts for the next hour that we're going to be talking through um, for uh, folks who are pretty well known uh, in the world of uh, emergency medicine education, uh, who are going to be talking to us about some really exciting work that they've done. Uh, and then the last hour of the summit, uh, I encourage folks to stick around. Uh, we've got some real uh, giants in the field, uh, profess all professors of uh, medical education who've made their career in uh, sort of medical education specifically. Uh, so it should be a, a a great afternoon. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to uh, let Dr. O'Shea take it away. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is James O'Shea. I'm one of the APDs at Emory in Atlanta. And I'm here to talk about a mindfulness retreat that we ran last year um, aimed at reducing burnout. So just to get straight to the highlights, we did a 2.5 hour intervention with 60 residents. The intervention was designed by me and a colleague of mine um, who is an MBSR teacher. So we thought it important to have uh, a high quality mindfulness teacher, but also in addition uh, for the intervention to be informed by an ED physician who also meditates and uses techniques on shift. So it wasn't uh, just a mindfulness intervention per se, it was also trying to leverage skills that could be used on shift. So we found a sequential decrease in burnout perceived stress across three time points. So we checked burnout with the Maslash burnout inventory, uh, the perceived stress scale and trait mindfulness scale at two weeks before the intervention, a week after the intervention and a month later. And we found across those three time points there was a significant reduction in burnout and perceived stress. So most of the uh, variance, uh, most of the effect um, in terms of re the reduction in burnout was accounted for by emotional exhaustion and a significant decrease in that. So drilling down into this a little bit, as you know, there are three subscales in the, the MBI. And what we found, our residents actually represented a, an overextended subtype. So for example, their depersonalization scores were actually really good. So they weren't actually depersonalizing their patients or themselves or other people much at all. Um, similarly, but with emotional exhaustion, they appeared very emotionally exhausted. Um, from the time one data, we also found out that uh, there was a, a significant correlation between high trait mindfulness and uh, low depersonalization scores. So if the resident had high trait mindfulness, they were less likely to uh, you know, depersonalize their patients themselves or other colleagues, which is interesting. So uh, it was delivered to the 60 residents at their annual retreat. It's the only time in the year when everyone is together, so it's a good opportunity. Um, the kind of standard in the literature for looking at mindfulness-based interventions in physicians is an MBSR program, which is an eight-week program delivered over two hours each week. Uh, that's pretty much impossible to deliver to shift workers. So we looked at uh, ways of doing it where we could get a quality intervention without doing eight weeks of, of a schedule that we couldn't, couldn't maintain. Uh, there has been some literature, in, uh, mainly in primary care doctors, uh, looking at abbreviated mindfulness-based interventions that showed a good effect. So um, in kind of modeling on that, we, we did a, a 2.5 hour intervention. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about what causes mindfulness, or sorry, what causes burnout nowadays and how, what to do about it. It seems clear that organizational strategies are key. You know, you have to deal with the organizational issues. I think the day of basically blaming the individual doctor and their lack of resilience are behind us, thankfully. However, my, um, in, individual focused interventions are still important. Uh, there is the idea of a mindful organization and mindful contagion. So within, um, if you have an organization populated by individuals who are familiar with the techniques, who communicate mindfully with, with each other, it does change the organization as well. So it's not just an individual effect, it can also be organizational. But strategies to deal with organizational change are still more important. Um, so this actually, this study was the first phase of a larger study, uh, which we have not reported on yet because we haven't analyzed the data. So I'm interested to see if 
we can teach EM residents skills from a contemplative practice tradition that can be used to modulate their stress reaction on shift. So to that end, all of these 60 residents were trained. About a month later, they, went on, they underwent a high fidelity sim, um, which is part of their uh, yearly assessment. So, so they have a sim twice a year. Um, we placed heart rate variability monitors on the residents uh, before they went in. And then we exposed them to a three minute uh, meditation, which is the intervention, or a three minute control. And then we looked at their heart rate variability in the sim. It was a within subjects design. So the same residents, if they got the intervention uh, in the first half of the year, when they repeated it like a month ago, they got the other, the, the control or vice versa. So we're still analyzing that data. We just got it finished the other day. So I'd be excited to see if uh, a group of residents who have a training in mindfulness can then take that forward and use it on shift. Ideally, three minutes is too long. It's far too long for an ER doctor. Nobody has time to go and sit and meditate, and most people don't want to. So it's very important to realize that my goal is not to create meditators. I think that's an impossible goal. You know, maybe a couple of people will decide to have a daily meditative practice. I think that's great. You know, it's like exercise, it's good for you. But what I'm more interested in is if we can extract some useful interventions and skills from this tradition and use it in um, trained residents on shift. So the next phase of the study, after we analyze the HRV data, will be to um, use the HRV monitors um, on shift with um, observers who can kind of timestamp the uh, interactions that the physician is having, what kind of uh, case they're looking at. We're going to look at patient outcomes, the patient experience, and try to relate that to the use of these skills on shift by the physician. So that's the next kind of step. What I'm presenting here is the first phase of that. So in a way, it's great that, that our study showed a reduction in, um, in burnout. It's great that it showed a reduction in perceived stress, but I'm probably more interested in if we can extract these skills and use them on shift. Any questions? Excellent. Yeah, sure. So, um, Can you repeat the question? Sorry, just for the monitor. So the question was, um, what type of on-shift strategies were we teaching and using? So um, the way I kind of conceptualize it is I imagine, um, and I do this myself, but I imagine the resident going about their day on shift. So they'll do a certain number of things. They will sit at a computer. They will stand at the end of a bed and run a code or, or a resuscitation. They will walk between these things. They will um, interact with patients. They will wash their hands. So the uh, focus is on those kind of skills. So medit formal meditation can be done sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. Residents don't tend to lie down on shift, so we skip that one. But <clears throat> you can teach a resident to uh, walk mindfully, sort of when they're walking to a case. They can anchor onto the sensation of their feet on the ground. Uh, when they come out of the case, you can anchor on the sensation of water as you wash your hands. And uh, when you sit at the computer, you can uh, use the bodily sensations of your back against the chair, your fingers on the keypads. All of this only makes sense really if you've had a basic training in mindfulness. So like to start off just talking about that, it's really difficult. Somebody has to kind of just sit a little bit and practice a little bit to kind of understand what you're doing. Because really what you're doing is just attending to um, physical sensations that arise moment to moment. It's, it's very simple. Um, the other thing that we've kind of added is uh, dyads, so mindful communication, or using the patient as an object of meditation. So if you have an open awareness that's non-judgmental when you're with a patient, you can actually extract more useful information from them. That's not the goal. The goal is to have a good you know, interaction, and, uh, but you still need to get the information you, you have to get to do your job. And so, you know, practically speaking, you are more successful at doing that if you approach it with open awareness, because you're aware of everything, not just what you need to get, you know. So we're we'll trying to keep it really, really practical. Does that answer your question? Okay. What kind of heart rate variability monitors are you using? We're using the endpoint system. So they're, they're the smallest on the market. They're very, very small. So uh, it's kind of like maybe this big. There's one on the chest, one on the leg. 
Um, once you have them on, um, you pretty much don't know you're wearing them. Uh, it does require a bit of a wax job to get them off. So if you have a lot of chest hair, um, <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, it's recorded in their faces. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I have to say though, the participation rate was really high. There was no incentive offered for the HRV study and we had a 93% participation rate. So I've basically got 70 minutes of HRV data on almost all of our residents um, at rest in the sim, after the sim. So I'm kind of excited to analyze that and see if it's useful. Yeah, so 80% of them um, found the retreat very or extremely useful. I mean, that's nice, I'm delighted, but really it's if they're going to use it or not. So what we found was actually about 64% of residents in the month after the retreat were using these skills on shift two or three times at least, which I, I think is great. Um, I'm very happy with that. Um, probably even more impressive to me is that 50% of them are doing it. were doing it two or three times a week at home. Because again, my goal is not to make meditators. That would be fantastic, but that's not gonna happen. But if they can use these skills at home, so much the better. Because I do think a sustaining daily practice increases the effectiveness of these interventions on shift. I totally agree and I actually do it myself before every shift. I sit in my car and meditate for three to five minutes. I feel like uh, on shift, you know, it's like a domino. If the first one goes wrong, it tends to continue along like that. So if you arrive in the right frame of mind, it helps. So one thing, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of cognizant that this three minutes is too long, but you know, one thing that, that makes me um, hopeful that it's still useful is that those three minutes could be at the start of your shift. You know, you could just do it at the start. Um, as somebody who does this every day, I found it extremely difficult to do it after the shift, and I think it would be useful, but you know, you get off a trauma shift, it, you just want to get home, and it's kind of tough. I find it a lot easier to do it regularly before the shift. Yeah. Um, one other thing about the 93% participation rate, that was for phase two. For phase one, which is this, it was for across the three time points, it was 70%, 60%, 50%. And mainly that's because we we're doing questionnaires and questionnaires suck. And nobody wants to do them. And I had to, I used the financial incentive. Uh, there was no incentive for the second part and everybody was happy to be involved. But if you're gonna ask for questionnaires, if, if you want good numbers, you know, you might have to pay. Excellent, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right.